well. So I'm especially delighted today to be able to introduce Dr. Amy Athey, um, who is a licensed psychologist and serves as the University of Arizona's Associate Vice Provost and First Chief Wellness Officer. Uh, she, in that capacity, she works with staff and faculty experts from all over campus to define and lead the university's health and wellness vision, which includes establishing opportunities for research and professional training and funding for health and wellness initiatives. Um, she most recently oversaw the creation of Wildcat Rise, which you're going to learn more about later today. And she's building a campus health and wellness board to provide inclusive excellence for the health and wellness initiatives of the university. I'll just say a little bit more about her tenure here at the university, which has been rich and varied. Um, she, she's uh, been here for five years and was initially the Associate Director of Psych Psychological Services and Wellness in the Department of Athletics. She then moved on to become the Executive Director for Student Wellness in the Office of Student Success and Retention, where she provided uh, continued leadership in the development and implementation and evaluation of mental health and wellness solutions to positively impact both undergraduate retention and graduation rates. I'm very delighted to have her talking to us today about um, psychological body armor and, and resilience. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Athey, for being with us. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Wonderful, well, thank you. And can everyone hear me okay? Do we have a thumbs up? Thumbs up for that? Okay. Um, well, thank you all for this opportunity. And um, I will also um, give kudos back to David and Cassandra um, for helping pull this um, webinar together today. Um, certainly, we are all juggling many balls in the air. Um, and part of um, navigating this land in, in this Zoom world is sometimes also the blend of our um, personal life or our family life and then as well as our work. So I will just um, let everyone know that if my dog barks in about 10 minutes, it is because I'm juggling that mom ball and, and arranging for a ride for my, my daughter to make it to one of her activities. So I just, I, I will forewarn everyone. So thank you for your grace. Um, but let's jump in today. Our, our plan today was to have a conversation a bit about resilience and um, leave about 15 to 30 minutes for questions. So hopefully we can um, have an engaged conversation and really the slides are just a jump off point. So um, in sometimes East Coast fashion, I can, I can speak pretty quickly. I'll try to keep an eye on that time. Cassandra's here is helping me as well and being able to relay some of those questions. And I, I really look forward to the dialogue at the end. Um, so let's jump into this. So why does this matter? Um, at the end of the day, one cannot perform if not well. Um, we think of all of our roles that we hold in our lives, whether that is a student, of um, employee, of, of parent, of spouse, of friend, of brother, of sister. Regardless of that role, we have to perform. And some of those performances are, are, are much more, um, I guess, critical, if you will, in that you, it may mean passing a class or completing that dissertation um, successfully, but also they may, it may be um, less discreet of a performance, rather uh, the over, your overall performance in that relationship. And if we aren't well, it's very hard to perform. So my the foundation of, of my um, professional experience has been training in clinical psychology and early on disaster psychology, navigating and responding and growing through trauma. Um, and then later on, I specialized in sport and performance psychology. So for me, it always comes back to that foundation of how do we take care of ourselves? And really what we've seen um, in the literature is an evolution and understanding that resilience really comes about in considering this to be our psychological body armor. This is a term that I took from a book called Stronger. Dr. George Everly is the author of that book. And um, really what we're referring to is the ability for one to bounce back and to pick yourself up again and kind of try, try again. Um, sometimes that means that continuing 
continued effort and perseverance results in that, that destination, that success, sometimes that continued effort attempt um, may mean that you have additional information that helps direct you into a more productive direction. Um, I wanted to touch on today some key factors that we know from the literature influences and strengthens that body armor. And then later on in our talk, I'll, talk, uh, I'll share back a little bit of um, what we know in critical incidents. So the acute stress that we may be feeling in adjusting to um, the impact of the pandemic, for example, or racial injustice or violence. First, psychological body armor. These factors help us withstand the adversity. So if you can consider strengthening that armor as a form of immunity, um, it helps us improve our decision-making under pressure. Um, certainly it'll motivate us to achieve that peak performance. And again, going back to that, that resilience component of being able to bounce back quickly or effectively, even if temporarily knocked down. Um, indeed, life throws us many punches. Sometimes they just kind of take us one step back and sometimes literally we're, we're sitting on the ground wondering what happened to us. Um, but some of these factors allow us to be able to get back up more efficiently. Um, and then lastly, these factors also influence our life satisfaction and happiness. So let's dive in for a minute to the psychological body armor and some of those key factors. So <clears throat> one I wanted to talk about at first here is active optimism. What do I mean by that? Um, this is similar to ben Bandura's um, self-efficacy model. And so for some of you who may not be as familiar with Bandura's work, um, <clears throat> what we're talking about here is um, one's belief and their ability to be able to execute a specific um, task. It could be more generalized. Um, but we learn from four different ways um, of, of in, in, in kind of internalizing that belief. So first, our own personal attainment. So those small successes that have layered on have become bigger successes with time. And over those layered successes, our confidence and our belief grows. Um, this contributes to that act of optimism and that we, we can reflect back on our experiences and think to, okay, what are some other stressful times and how was I able to navigate that? It's a common question I'll ask people when they're in a, even a crisis. I'll say, okay, think back on some times that have really hit you, life has hit you with a couple of punches. What helped you then? What was something that you did during those times that helped you bounce back and navigate the stress that you, you were dealing with? So that personal attainment is, is critical. It feeds into that active optimism so that it's grounded optimism. It's not just this whimsical belief, oh yeah, I can make it. No, you went through a stressful event in the past. You learned from that. There was something you did that helped. And certainly there may be something now that you, you, you can take with you and you can use in this current, um, whatever the current stress that you're facing. Um, observation. <clears throat> Really, we have an opportunity to learn from everyone right now because these are stressful times. Watching and learning from others is the second most powerful way we learn. And so when we think about um, or watch others being successful at navigating these things, um, stress or um, setbacks, we can learn from those opportunities as well. So this is where we really encourage people to connect. Connect with your mentors. They're, they have been through a lot of adversity to get to where they are at. Um, it may not be the exact same case, same details, but certainly they have had life experiences that have been frustrating, stressful, or even that they felt knocked down. And we have an opportunity to learn from them. Encouragement and support. So we all know that encouragement and support helps us. Um, I'll take it a step further and challenge you to consider how do we accept that support? Do we embrace it? And do we take it a step further, knowing that it can help us <clears throat> strengthen that body armor? Do we actively seek it out? Um, there's a lot that, that um, we've come to understand around help seeking. And oftentimes, tier one performers, high achievers in, in many um, specific industries, um, 
it's been frowned upon, frankly. Um, there's even been uh, po like policies or, or processes that's reinforced the stigma for help seeking rather than suggesting that actually this is, this is a sign of strength that you are seeking out this help, this support. Um, and so I really challenge all of us to recognize and goes back to the original premise. One cannot perform if you are not well. And if you do not have the opportunity to connect with others, to strengthen that body armor, it's, it's harder to navigate some of the demands that we are under. Lastly, self-control. Um, this goes back to self-regulation and the emotional regulation that is at play when we're dealing with stressful demands. When we take that first punch, that fight flight response is gonna be activated. If we are under chronic stress, imagine taking punches hour after hour after hour. A couple of things happen. One, our immune system takes a hit. Um, and so we're actually more susceptible to getting sick because we're worn down with the chronic sympathetic activation that's going on to respond to the demand. So when we're looking at adversity and all the stress that we may be dealing with we want to think both in this game in this round what punches we have to we are taking and how can we recover we're also thinking long term so that we're not chronically under stress so we think about um, ways that we can um, engage in self-care especially for that long-term buildup of that of that adversity or, or that sympathetic response we also think about grounding ways that we can kind of deactivate and regulate our emotions in the moment in that high pressure situation or in that one acute or um, stressful event. So I'll skip over now to um, talk about decisive action. Decisiveness and, and responsibility, um, we have found from researchers that they have been associated with health outcomes, including a longer life. And so I think it's important for us to talk a little bit here about what do we mean by decisive action and what are some takeaways you could use to help influence your decision-making framework. Um, two concepts I wanna share, um, one, the halo effect, and two, self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, self-fulfilling prophecy, many of you have been probably have heard of this from if you took an intro psych class in, in undergrad. Um, but really, it is that whole premise that um, if we have an expectation that influences then the result. So if I expect, um, if I'm looking for um, this to be a positive engagement, it influences the inter my behavior and the interaction, and it's likely then to be more of a positive interaction. Halo effect, um, Thorndike noted that the halo, halo effect is really a cognitive perceptual bias. And this happens when people who possess the attributes that others desire, but don't possess, such as decisiveness, are actually perceived to be as attractive, courageous, strong, um, or even successful. So I want to combine these two principles for a minute. If you can be extraordinarily decisive when others cannot be, you are likely to benefit from the beneficiary, be the beneficiary of that halo effect and be seen also as extraordinary in other ways. So if you combine then that halo effect and the power of the self-fulfilling prophecy, who knows how far you will be able to go. So let's talk about decision-making because if we know decision-making is, is so significant, what, what are some frameworks that we can consider kind of takeaways to help you as you're, you're dealing with even small or even larger decisions. And the framework I'll leave with you today is, uh, it's called like a best case, worst case, or Pascal's wager decision making. When you're faced with the decision, I encourage you to think about what is the best thing that could happen or is likely to happen if I act? And what is the worst thing that could happen if you act? And then flip the coin and ask the same questions. What's the best thing that's likely to happen if I don't act? And what's the worst thing that's likely to happen if I don't act? This framework can help break down the components of the decision making um, or of the decision that you, you are having to make and, and, and maybe bring to light key um, 
either, um, I guess, fears, um, or it could be other um, grounded data that can illuminate and help you in making the decision. So key, again, in that psychological body armor um, comes into play is that being able to take decisive action. So that's one framework you may consider in being able to do so. Um, a moral compass, um, there is a lot in the literature about values-driven um, choices or, or decisions. And, and having a, um, an awareness of your core values can, can really help ground and, and strengthen that, um, that psychological body armor. Doesn't necessarily mean that some of the decisions you may be facing right now are easy ones. Certainly many of us are dealing with the stress of making decisions that is unlike any that we've had ever before in our lives. Um, but certainly being grounded in, in understanding what are your core values can help um, as you're making the decision and then also dealing with the consequences from those decisions. Um, so a couple of those core um, values and um, providing that moral compass for resilience, maybe in honesty, acting with integrity, fidelity, um, and certain other ethical behaviors. Lastly, um, I want to spend a moment, and this springboard, springboards us into um, sharing back some of our resources on campus, and then also understanding and appreciate, appreciating what may be going on um, with our current, um, our current life experiences or stressors that we're dealing with. Let's talk about interpersonal support. This is the most powerful predictor of, of resilience. And um, it really leads us to first saying thank you for showing up today. This was an opportunity to connect. And, and as I mentioned, we'll have an opportunity for dialogue and questions um, in, in our, the latter part of our webinar here. Um, but being able to connect with those who may be going through similar experiences is critical right now. Um, again, the most powerful predictor is that connection and that support. So a word to responding to crisis. Um, this is a slide and I'm going to try to enlarge it if it will cooperate with me. This is a disaster response slide. This comes from Sam SAMHSA, it's a, uh, Myers and Zunin were the initial researchers on this. And this really captures what we've come to understand of the psychological responses that occur to critical incidents or stressful events. And I wanna highlight a bit of this for you and also um, share back how and relate how it may be impacting all of us during this time. Um, during a disaster or critical incident, there's actually the, the, the threat phase that happens before the event. Um, some of us may have experienced this if, if you were following world news and aware of um, when COVID first was discovered in China. And then also we saw the numbers and in, in the impact of COVID in Europe. And before it really started impacting the United States at, in mass, um, we had some data. And some people may have experienced disbelief um, some may have experienced a sense of vulnerability and questioning the impact of the what ifs. Um, and so there is that kind of warning or threat phase and then the event occurs. This slide really depicts a, a phase of, re of response um, following an acute event. And so I wanted to share it because it's important to note that when it first occurred, I think all of us in some regards when we, when we transitioned abruptly in March to remote learning, remote campus, we, in some sense, oh, well, we'll be back in a couple weeks or maybe we'll wrap this up, right? We're in a very prolonged or protracted nature of a critical incident now, which makes this a bit more complicated. Um, but nonetheless, what you are starting to see are people's reactions at various phases. Some people may still have some heightened anxiety or even disbelief that we are in the stage of where we are in responding to the pandemic. Some may experience a honeymoon phase and some of those reactions may be captured by gratitude while 
at least, you know, I don't know anyone who has been impacted or fallen sick with the virus. Others though, maybe in a disillusionment phase and, and some common stress reactions there may be fatigue or blame, anger, sadness, or grief. What's key here is that we can all move through, um, through these phases um, and with further support, we can recover um, and, and actually what we call is a, a reconstruction phase. So let me actually shrink this down. And this is just a slide that has a bit more, um, it has more considerations but what's important to note is that oftentimes the stress reactions really don't really hit us until that disillusionment phase. So when this first started back in March, many people said, oh, I'm fine, it's good. And odds are they could have been just fine or they just weren't telling you that they were impacted. Even in the honeymoon phase, like, oh, we're, we made it actually, I, I'm in a good rhythm. Denial can be very active. And so some people may be dealing with distress and also just not sharing. Um, sometimes then what we can see is the bottom starts falling out and people have that stress um, and, and may, may be sharing it. It's important to know that these are all normal reactions to abnormal events. And I'm going to get into the details of that in just a minute. But before I do, this is a slide from an Institute of Medicine report. Um, Actually, Amanda Shai is the researcher here who, who really captured the psychological impact of stressful events tends to fall on a continuum. About a third of the people will have mild reactions and with their own psychological body armor can bounce back, but they may feel upset. They may feel um, worried or they may even notice their sleep is off. A third of people also may have more moderate reactions. Um, so their sleep disturbance lasts a bit longer or they may feel even more on edge or anxious. And then we do know a third of the people may become impaired from these psychological um, reactions and or immobilized. And as a result may need psychological treatment, added supports to facilitate that recovery. But it's important to note that most people do not need treatment. Most people will rebound, recover with that psychological body armor, connection with their own social supports. They may also be engaging in self-care or reaching out to um, peer support or counseling to higher ed, and I hear about, you know, 71% of people are feeling anxious or 60% of people are feeling depressed. Um, my response to that is no kidding, right? I, I, I don't know what people are expecting. I don't necessarily, um, I broke them down here, physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. Again, normalizing these reactions. There is an asterisk next to the, the physical. We know that the mind body is connected. So if we are having a high degree of anxiety or distress emotionally, it is possible that someone is experiencing physical stress reactions. It could be elevated blood pressure, it could be nausea, it could be chest pain, dizziness, vomiting, any of those physical signs, we do recommend that they are medically evaluated just to be sure that there's no other medical condition that needs to be treated at that time. The emotional, cognitive, and behavioral stress reactions are also there. Again, normalizing these. Um, I'm usually a really good sleeper. And um, during, since March, I, I kind of have hit and miss where, you know, one night I may just not sleep as well. And that's not, that's not my normal. Um, it is normal, however, given this abnormal event. Um, likewise, you may feel at times more overwhelmed than normal. Well, it may be normal given these abnormal events. And so um, we really try to um, engage in some compassion in normalizing these. 
um, reactions. Um, and then trying to strengthen our coping and self-care to be able to offset or the demands and the impact from all of these. Um, so you can see here, you may see this in your students. Um, if you're teaching, you may see them um, not have the cognitive flexibility um, that you typically would have seen at this point in the year. You may see poor um, decision making or concentrating, concentration being impacted. Um, and emotionally, um, also kind of just being on edge or kind of people snapping a little bit more um, than they typically would have. Um, so what can we do? I, I'll leave you as we're wrapping up and, and transitioning into our resources um, with this one resource. This um, organization was started by a friend and colleague I met when I was in grad school and um, in the late 90s. Um, Dr. Rob Fazio is a psychologist who went on to specialize in, in IO and, and helping leaders and organizations um, optimize their performance. Um, Rob's father was um, in Trade Tower 2 on 9-11 and he actually got out and he went back and held the door for his colleagues to leave. Um, Rob lost his father on 9-11 and um, truly has been inspiring so many to be able to grow through loss and adversity. He and his family established the Hold the Door Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization whose goal is just what I described, to help people grow through adversity and loss. And I love this model that they have offered. We think of what we do right now to connect with people we also have the opportunity every day to learn, to laugh, and to love. And they challenge us to think of every day, what is one thing I can do to learn? What is one thing I can do to laugh? And was one, what is one way or one thing I can do to share my love? Um, and so I, this is a great resource. I, I share it with many people I have on other webinars during this time, um, but really um, encourage you to check that out. Self-care, we mentioned the stress reactions impacting our mind and our body. And a commitment of self-care really must be comprehensive um, when we are um, dealing with the chronicity of the stress and demands that are upon us right now. Oftentimes you'll hear of the physical recommendations, sleep, hydration, nutrition, right? Um, but I also encourage you to consider these other areas of your life your spiritual um, self-care, connecting with your faith community, um, psychological self-care, help giving, your, um, giving yourself opportunities to basically deep down, down regulate the system, right? So it, you can creatively um, express through art, um, music, writing. Um, there's a lot in the literature around the power of journaling to, ex to express. Um, connecting with nature or other calming stimuli. I mentioned the, the social interpersonal. So a takeaway here is complete work projects and, and it has been incredibly challenging in this zoom world to do this um, but as the way that you can get creative whether that's cars parked in a parking lot um, or being able to even talk on the phone and even get off zoom to, to mix it up I really encourage you to connect and then those boundaries um, I've talked a lot, we've talked a lot about this work-life balance, which I, I kind of chuckle at, frankly. Um, and mostly because I've worked with tier one performers for most of my career. Many tier one performers, when we think about this life-work balance, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like this uh, kind of false model because really their lifestyle, their work is their lifestyle. So for example, I worked in athletics for 15 years. Um, it, it wasn't a job, it was a lifestyle. Um, but there were key moments where I had to um, 
set and, 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 and monitored those boundaries. Um, right now, when we transition to remote work, similarly, um, this separation of work and life is, is very hard right now to um, implement and, and even conceptualize at times. So I encourage you to kind of think of that integration and being fluid, but really thinking about and self-monitoring to take action to care for yourself. So for me, that may mean um, I get up an hour earlier and I do work because then I have to get my kids set up for homeschool during what would have been the traditional start of my day. Um, so again, having that flexibility right now is crucial. My, my motto for our house right now, 2020, our motto is roll with it. We're gonna roll with it. We're right now in remote school. One, one kiddo is gonna go back to a hybrid model. We're gonna roll with it. I don't know how long that will last, but we're gonna roll with it. So commit to self-care. Think of this very comprehensively. And then some resources. Um, I mentioned, uh, Megalota mentioned at the beginning of our talk, um, the development of Wildcats Rise. I want to share that with you. This is a free or no cost program for all U of A students. Um, we do have a number of graduate students um, who we have trained in psychological first aid. Psychological first aid is the standard of practice in meeting the large scale mental health demands that come from large scale critical incidents such as a pandemic. Um, we were fortunate to have over 90 applicants to be peer leaders for this program and they've received over 18 hours of psychological first aid training. Um, you can go to our website to schedule your support if you would like to be able to connect with someone who truly can relate because they are a grad student. Um, they have been trained on, on how and how best to, to provide that support. Um, we are offering that weekly virtual peer support for our graduate students at no cost. You can go to our website. You can learn more about the program with our frequently asked questions page. But even more importantly, you'll have an opportunity to schedule that support. We have a number of groups being offered right now for our graduate students. Um, you just need to uh, click the, the time that you're interested in attending. Um, you, you will um, have a pop-up form that is just, it's very simple with your name and email so we can send you that Zoom link and password to protect the integrity of that meeting. Um, and if you're interested in individual consultation, that is also available. So the t each team meeting is, it lasts about an hour and has two of our Wildcats Rise peer leaders um, for, uh, facilitating that meeting. Those two RISE peer leaders will offer their individual appointments, um, and so you will be able to connect with them individually if you would like just to have a one-on-one -on -one time as well. Again, that service is at no cost. We also across our system have additional resources for you right now. Campus Health and CAPS, um, both offering um, medical and mental health services. Um, Campus Rec, a number of um, wellness services and LifeWork Connections offers child care or, or elder care um, connection resources for our students. I, I will leave this um, deck with you guys to have, so there's other um, additional resources here. Um, and that wraps it up. So um, I know I was talking pretty quickly. Um, and I think we'd like to transition to, to questions. I'm just looking at the chat here to see um, if there are any questions or I'll actually I'll turn it over to Cassandra to help me with that. Hi everyone, if you do have any questions, um, you can put them in the Q&A at the bottom and Amy uh, can get to them um, either now or if you'd like to have a private question, you can actually choose in there to be anonymous and you can uh, answer that as well. So feel free to type in there, or if you'd like to ask a question to the group, um, it's also possible for us to unmute you. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> All right, we better post them to the uh, Q&A box.
What are your suggestions, resources for new students who have just arrived in Tucson and do not have strong nearby support? Um, great question. Yeah, this is a challenging time for those who, who have relocated in the midst of this remote work or, or learning environment. Um, a couple of things. So I, I put a, on the deck the U of A campus resources, campus rec, uh, but also campus life. Um, I should have noted we do have um, groups um, organizing. So based on your interests, I would encourage you to look at the organizations on campus um, or even say campus rec. Um, they are having um, even kind of group types of classes. Um, Wildcats Rise is a great um, kind of connection tool because indeed you're, you are, you are um, connecting with, with peers and so they may too have more ideas around um, I guess interest groups or other, other groups getting together. Um, so I would say those three um, organizations, Campus Rack, Campus Life, and RISE could be really good connection tools. Um, the other piece is um, you know sometimes when we're under a lot of stress and, and in the midst of transition we we tend to revert back to what is most familiar and and yet at the same time taking risks and putting yourself out there may be helpful and being able to connect with people who you otherwise may not have connected with so for example the spiritual community if you are one who identifies with a specific faith community i would encourage you to take a risk it may feel like you're putting yourself out there, but checking out one of those um, service offerings um, or likewise a recreational offering. Um, also within the graduate programs, I, I, there are some that also have um, kind of, um, I guess, social groups or, or uh, kind of mentoring types of groups. So I would check also with your department for that availability. Okay, so halo effect and how does it, relate to resilience. It's really the combination of the halo effect and the self-fulfilling prophecy. So the halo effect, um, I'll go back um, to what that is. So we'll start, the halo effect really is related to decisiveness. And what we have seen is that um, people who are extraordinarily decisive when others cannot be, um, may be perceived at, to even be stronger, if you will. So beyond just being perceived as um, deceptive, you also may be perceived as attractive, courageous, strong, competent, successful. So others see you at that way. Um, if you connect that then with the power of self-fulfilling prophecy, the point is your armor is strengthened. So not only then do others start seeing you as strong, the expectation is that you are strong, self-fulfilling prophecy then, it, 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 it becomes um, a cycle in a positive direction, right? So others are seeing you, you're kind of, you're kind of embracing that and it, it starts um, building on each other. And feeling that you are you can do more so it kind of um, influences overall your um, self-efficacy or that belief um, because now others are seeing you this and it all started with being able to make um, a decision when others may be struggling so that was kind of the intersection of the halo and the self-fulfilling prophecy um, do you know how many students are attending Wildcats Rise? I went to one a couple weeks ago and there was only one. And um, I haven't received this week's numbers. Um, if you went two weeks, if you went a couple weeks ago, it just launched. So I would encourage you to check it out again. Um, this is a brand new program and we've hit the main U of A social media channels and we're actively trying to get the word out, even from conversations similar to this one. Um, and so we are hoping more and more we'll hear about it and, and reach out for that support. So um, I haven't received the numbers this week, but it has grown each week. Um, and also students are able to kind of come in and out. So 
Um, if, you know, it didn't match up for your schedule this week, but it could next week, I would encourage you to still click uh, and, and get the link and attend the group. Um, and then likewise, if, if you're feeling like you're kind of managing things fairly well that week and you don't need that added support, you may not attend, but then another week you're, you're welcome to re-engage. So it, it's not like a group therapy where you would have to enter and continue every week. You can really go in and out as you need it. Um, so I encourage you to check that, check that out again. Um, another question. I had a therapist who used to say things like, I don't mean to say get over it, but it was really unhelpful. And I thought I heard a hint of that in there. Could you go into that a little? Um, yeah, I, I'm, if you heard a hint of that, that, that was not my intention. Um, if anything, I think there is power in actually acknowledging the stress, normalizing it, and, and, and part of that um, acceptance of this is, the, this is where we are at, what can I do, what can I commit to to help, my, help me cope with where we're at right now? Um, whether that's our perspective is of kind of roll with it mantra, um, whether that the power of connection, so connecting with um, perhaps your colleagues, um, family, friends, additional supports such as RISE, um, but certainly no, I, I didn't mean um, get over it. What I mean is, I think it's really important right now for us to normalize and not pathologize the stressful reactions that we are all experiencing. So I hope that, um, I hope that clears that, that question up. These are great questions. Um, keep firing away. So I'll ask one of the group, and if you can use the Q&A, it would be probably helpful. Um, uh, is it possible to request your presentation at other units? Absolutely. Um, Cassandra, would you mind typing into the chat our, um, our email? It's wellness at arizona.edu, I believe, but she can help me out. with. with yeah, that. no problem. I'll do that. Um, if anybody would like a presentation, we would be glad to um, share back and even tailor it to unique needs of a department. Um, so I just have a question to the group. I, if you wouldn't mind in the Q&A, you can answer anonymously, um, but I put up the common stress reactions that are in there. I, I was just wondering if you would please respond and, and share back what stress reaction kind of nags you the most? Like what is the challenge that you are facing right now? It could be things like um, irritability or problems sleeping or my appetite suppressed or I just cognitively get kind of foggy or have a hard time making decisions. Um, Can you put that slide up again, Amy? Cause yeah. it's not showing, that would be good. Sure, yeah. Thanks. There we go. Is that one showing, Cassandra? You're good. Okay. So if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, you can do so anonymously. I'm just curious kind of what stress reaction seems to really be um, challenging you during this time. So it sounds like um, people are having some inflammation, body pain, um, health, feeling overwhelmed, anger and frustration. Um, the reason I ask is, is this, is then when we're talking about self-care or coping, and this goes back to the person's question about kind of the get over it, right? Um, we can consider targeted um, stress activities. So for example, if you're having a lot with the anger and frustration, especially given the lack of control, what I'm hearing in that response is that you have the emotional triggers 
Um, and then you have the cognitive piece. So lack of control, it, it is very, um, it is very triggering of that sympathetic response. And then also what can end up happen is we can anchor down cognitively and become more rigid. So, and it becomes a vicious cycle then. So what I would encourage you all to consider is for the health, the physical, um, with the inflammation practices such as mindfulness or anything that's going to activate the parasympathetic response. So deep breathing, Headspace is an app that's out there. I believe if, if you have a student, uh, I think a student membership there or subscription there is like $9, I think. Um, but they have guided imagery that can help you. And research shows over about 20 minutes every day for about two weeks, it could have the same impact as anti-anxiety medication. Um, pain also impacts sleep. Um, and so taking a look and making sure that your sleep routines and your deactivating routine at night can be um, as, as kind of setting you up for success as, as possible. So at night, engaging in that deactivating routine, whether that's a warm shower or bath, getting off the devices about 20 to 30 minutes before you lay down, um, and, and engaging in stimulus control. So keeping the bed for sleep and sex only and not shooting off that last email or that last text or checking that social media account while you're in, laying in bed. So um, I, I just, I, sh I shared back with you some of those strategies that could help with pain and, and health issues, as well as then that emotional regulation. Commonly, just think of subtle mind shifts and, and thinking of what, how I can be um, more flexible um, with my expectations, right? Can we roll with it? Can I get just, you know, what can I learn from this today? have a, uh, an attitude of curiosity um, with it, can help break it up from a, a rigidity if you get locked in. Um, I'm having more mental fog, fatigue and anxiety. Yeah, so mental fog, I, I gotta admit, I, I'm, I'm with you. There are some days where I have a clearer head than others. Um, and I think we have a lot that we could um, take away from the self-compassion literature um, here. And, and, and going back to um, certainly acknowledging, hey, like right now I woke up and I thought I would be ready to go. And I, it is everything I can do to kind of power through these days. If you have an hour that you don't have to power through, what I'm finding is that actually stepping back and just kind of being where you're at for that hour then actually helps me move through that fatigue rather than if I keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting to get over it. Um, so the concept of moving through it rather than over it is critical. And so accepting this is where I'm at. Maybe I'm just going to take an hour. Maybe I'm going to take 25 minutes and try to meditate go for a walk, journal, and see if that can kind of release it rather than to continue to, to pound through it. Um, feelings of giving up. Um, you know, right now the power of hope is important. <clears throat> and um, the chronicity of the stress that we're in right now, um, it feels, it does feel overwhelming at times. Um, and, and I guess, I would like to share back and, and challenge all of us to, to remind ourselves that this too shall pass. It, it feels as if we are in a long marathon. The reality is that we have, we've known people who not only run the, the, the marathon, but have our ultra marathoners, right? They've run a hundred miles. Um, and so we can learn for some of their strategies too for when this feels like we've got another 100 miles that we're running, what can we do? And, it, and that really comes back to, you know what, what can I do for this one step? And so instead of thinking of this semester 
instead of thinking of this month, instead of thinking about this week, I would challenge all of us when we feel like giving up or we're, we're wondering, um, think, just kind of come back to the basics. Like what's, I just need one thing that I can do to take care of myself for this next hour. Um, and that's okay. It can be hour by hour. Um, you know, feelings of giving up sometimes can also relate with thoughts of giving up. And that could be also related to maybe you've thought of death or suicide. And I would be remiss if I'm not acknowledging that directly. Um, during times where we get really overwhelmed um, and if we're not sleeping or things are super stressful, people can have those thoughts. And if that has happened with you, I, I strongly encourage you to reach out um, to people who can help you navigate that and support you and it and can help get you through that. Um, that resource could be contacting CAPS and I will put that number in the chat here. Um, CAPS has a zoom that you can it's a walk-in zoom you can always access um, online as well if you want to check out their website but this phone number is also available after hours so if you're feeling or having thoughts of hurting yourself right now please call them um, and and they can help connect you um, and get you that appointment um, if if anyone is <clears throat> also having other 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 uh needs besides i guess if they're looking to connect with other resources outside of caps i would still encourage you to call caps because they can help connect you to those resources whether that's using your insurance or whatnot but this is a great number because there is someone always there to take the call um, so if you're having thoughts of hurting yourself please reach out to that number um, another question here is i'm having a, i'm planning on taking an out-of-state trip to see family for the first time since december and I have a lot of anxiety um, recommendations for being around other people i feel like i'm sacrificing my physical safety for my mental health yeah this is a really tricky balance right now um, the first thing i'd like to, us to take a step back and just recognize that we were living our lives prior to pandemic um, with risk. And, and sometimes we didn't really give it much attention. Um, when I drove from my home 45 minutes to campus, back and forth each day, I took on risk. Um, when I flew before, I took on risk. And what's sometimes challenging is before, I had, would have more anxiety over flying than I ever would getting in my car, driving back and forth um, to work. And so some of it is also challenging ourselves. What is, the, what is the risk? What is low, moderate, or high risk? Um, we know being in a closed space, it is higher risk than walking outside um, and, 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 and being outside with people. The flying piece, it is a higher risk, and yet also ground yourself in knowing that there are actions being taken to mitigate it as best we can. Um, so some of it is setting the expectations and, and, and reminding yourself, yeah, there is a risk, and yet also I'm gonna take these steps to mitigate it as best I can. But just like before, we, we have never lived our lives risk-free. Um, and it can help sometimes ground you. Um, I'm not sure all of what's going to happen once you arrive at your destination. Um, I'm hoping perhaps there are lower risk um, connection opportunities with friends or family. Um, I, I think I, I've also kind of grounded myself in acknowledging like we've always had risk and, and now we, we have to just think through those that, that risk that we're willing to need to engage in, as you mentioned, um, for your mental health, that is a risk as well. So I appreciate that, that decision. It's a challenging one. Um, and yet it seems as if you're, you've thought through what you need in that situation. Um, 
Okay, it's nice to hear about how many people share the same issues, but the gap has gotten so big between those who just keep moving forward and disretaining, et cetera. Um, so certainly I, I'm glad to hear it. It is helpful to connect and hear that there are many other of you who are, are dealing with these stress reactions um, and, and, and also kind of trying to figure out how to, to best navigate um, this space right now. Um, I, I will come back to this. I, I started the, the talk today sharing a little bit about my background. Um, and, and one of that is, is in um, high performance, tier one performance and, and a lot of athletic performance. Um, and I'll just share back the story. I, I've worked with a lot of tier one performers who over the years who have dealt with injury. Um, sometimes they're season ending injuries. Sometimes they were career ending injuries. And um, for those, I, I, I remember one student in particular, high level tier one athlete who um, on, on the first kind of the, the first uh, full practice, if you will, had a season ending injury, knocked her out. Surgery, long rehab, it's a battle. Um, and for those of you who may not be aware, in, in tier one athletics, when somebody gets injured, it's a very isolating experience. It's not just the pain or physical recovery that they have to go through the rehab to get back to the physical level of functioning. The other layer to this is that it's very isolating because usually all of that rehab is done separate and apart from any team interaction. They're not at practice. They're in the, the training room or their weight room, or the physical therapist, or the chiropractor. And so they're separated and it can be very um, disconnecting and it, can, it complicates the recovery, frankly, because they don't have as much of the support. They're not around their, their team. And they see everybody moving ahead. The student athlete battle back through this only to literally return and in the first game had the exact same injury to the other, her other leg. She was knocked out again. Um, and again, had another year of being separated, isolated, battling back. And um, one of the experiences that happens in that case is that it's really apparent and it really is almost like a black hole or trap door for her to start comparing herself to where she quote would have been. Well, if I was out there, if this hadn't happened, I would have been here with the team. I would have been here with my productivity, my stats, my contribution to the team. I would have been here in terms of what I could have received as far as all American awards and, and what could have been. And really what that becomes is it, Comparing yourself to others, and especially in a very different situation, um, it's apples and oranges, and it's going to really set you up, frankly. It's hard, it's hard to, to stay grounded. And, and what we use instead is what we call a mastery approach. And in the performance literature, mastery really refers to this continued pursuit of excellence for oneself. So the comparison is not to the teammate or to your counterpart who may be getting ahead in their chapter or defending a year early. It's, it's all self-referenced. What are your goals? And this is informed by your values. And, and so then whenever you catch yourself in that trap of comparing yourself to where somebody else is at, come back. It's almost, you can say hello, like, oh, you got me that time. Refocus, recenter on what, what is your pursuit in your craft? Um, and so I, I, I think it can be helpful. It doesn't take away the anxiety. None of these things here today is going to be the golden pill that's going to make all of the stress go away, the anxiety, the pain. Um, but little by little, 
they help strengthen that body armor. And that was the intention of the talk. One last um, resource I, I will share with you is a podcast called Finding Mastery related to the last point that I shared. It's by a, um, a colleague of mine named Mike Gervais. Um, and, and the framework he uses on his podcast is he's often interviewing elite tier one performers and, and disciplines um, and really um, is brings out in the interview various frameworks of being able to um, cope with the adversity, be able to bounce back and um, persevere in, in, in very, very demanding um, pursuits. So that's one last reference. I'm mindful of our time and I just blew past it. So um, my apologies. I encourage you all to um, um, please reach out to us if, if there's anything that health and wellness initiatives can do to support you and your departments, um, please um, don't hesitate. We would be glad to support in, in all that we could. So. Dr. Athey, I just, I think I'm speaking for all of us. I just want to say thank you so much for this presentation. It was helpful and informative and also very insightful. So really appreciate um, your help and all the resources you've directed us towards. And I hope that everybody uh, here stays well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was great meeting with all of you today. So thank you. Thank you.